Man, you know, I was actually kind of in the mood for pasta today. I'll be honest. No, All right. my balls are pizza, fine. pasta, etc. Yeah, I could do without pizza at this time point. But like, I pasta. love pizza so. Shut badly. up! We're doing Italy just now. All right, now we should probably like you know get starting if we have a time limit. Right. Right. This right, is right. part two. You can read the title. I hope. Otherwise, I don't know why you're here. Uh, okay. Go watch part one if you haven't. It's kind of important. Yeah, it has been uh, pretty important to build up with good old Mussolini and his black shirts as they try to sell newspapers and start beating up communists as well. Yeah, you need the deep <laughs> Star Wars lore at the same yeah. time. Deep, deep Star Wars lore. Mm-hmm. So basically, uh, this is the second episode on our rise of fascism in Italy uh, with our good boy Benito Mussolini. And today we are joined with our usual guests from last episode. We have Kevin. Hi. Uh, also, we have Luke from last That's time. That's me, the Scani. And uh, also, my sister is joining us once again, Ashley. What's up, bulls? And uh, I have my good friend Will, who is joining us for the first time. Hello. I wasn't here, and now I'm here. Yeah, and now he's here. He's here. I to feel pick like we just took attendance or something. <laughs> Pretty yep. much, yeah. Guys, welcome um, back to class. Say, et and now that we're back together again, it's time to pick up the story where we last left off, where our good friend Benito Mussolini started this little something called the fascists. And uh, they've been starting to ham up on all the rich people's problems by beating up communists and striking laborers. And he's starting to turn a few heads on his side as well. I'm still not so, entirely, entirely clear what the point of fascism is. He It's to be a uh, bundle of sticks. He wasn't very precise about this. Well, I mean, that's the thing, right? Because, like, he's coming around town. He's trying to sell a cause. And at the end of the day, you want to break it down. It's just, like, Italy is going to be better than it was before. Make Italy great again. That's honestly... <laughs> it's basically just a big nationalistic fervor by Benny here, isn't it? Yeah, no, honestly, that's that's a pretty accurate way of putting it. That and also adding on the fact that he is all about anti-communism and all about pro-struggle and pro-expansionism. So, like, yeah, those three things together, you pretty much got fascism. That and also a bunch of incoherent, angry nut jobs running around. So In black shirts. In black shirts. Newspapers. Yes. Violent newsies running around whacking <laughs> you if you don't buy their newspapers. Matt, but, this, uh, is a, this is a real... Uh real character arc here he started oh, no, out absolutely. as part of the started out as part of the socialists yeah that's right he started off once again as like a anti-war socialist and now he's like the complete other uh oh, complete yeah, opposite right. of that it's, it's amazing what a money big can flippy do flop <laughs> indeed yeah and also now um at this point he's starting to get a few admirers not just from like the the downtrodden you know the the unemployed, the, the angsty college students, or like the old war vets who are just pissed off at Italy not getting a thing from World War One. Now he's also got himself some uh, men of wealth and taste. He's got businessmen coming over to him. He's got industrialists. He's also just got like old aristocracy who wants to see Italy be great again. And they're all saying, you know what? You might want to consider a career in politics, my friend. And, uh, you know, that alongside with some healthy donations to make sure that it keeps tamping down the communists or communists in air quotes, because once again, this is mostly just angry workers who want a living wage. Wasn't he, wasn't he, well, didn't he say something about like not being about politics or something like fascism isn't about politics. It's above that. Well, I mean, at first, it was very much that. It was more like a spiritual movement of sorts. I mean, spiritual, as in, like, channeling yeah, the angry spirit of the people. spiritual, beating up people in the streets. Yeah. Right. Letting right. all of that angry. Spiritual. So sad. Yeah. And, like, technically speaking, he didn't really have any official ties with a lot of political groups at that time. Because Italy, it did have a democratic body of sorts. It had a parliament, it had its own elected representatives, and its whole, like, prime minister structure and all that jazz. Uh, and they also had, if you want to like to simplify things to just be patriotic, they had a king that you had to be loyal to. Um, so basically, if you want to be like above politics, but still be seen as patriotic, you just say, I'm doing this for the king. You know, I'm doing this for Italy, the people and the king. Screw the politicians and all that stuff. They don't. I wasn't aware that's... being a monarch wasn't pol- political. Well, that's the thing, because you kind of get born into it, you know, so 
I mean, the truth of it, yes, he's got to like balance a lot of stuff because at the end of the day, the king doesn't have too much power in Italy. Um, the king does have some ability to check certain appointments and kind of speed things along by giving his blessing. Also, the army's more or less just loyal to the king, but the king then sort of defers to what the government wants him to do. So it's kind of like this weird circle of accountability right there. But okay. if you want to show that you're loyal to the like to uh, to Italy and you're a nice patriot, you just say you love the king. Um, and also, if you want to be a good Italian at that time point, because of just how big the Catholic population is in Italy and just how powerful the church is, you just say you're a good Catholic as well. And that being loyal to the king and being a good Catholic were like the two branches of what it meant to be a respectable Italian during that oh, time yeah. period. What's the dynamic? with the king and the pope around this time do you know oh yeah it's uh <laughs> it's not a good one uh, let's just put it that way <laughs> yeah Charlemagne so, took the crown from the pope instead of letting him crown him obviously oh no this is even better than that imagine Charlemagne taking the crown that didn't exist from the pope's hand and then taking some of the pope's land too and refusing to give him a dime <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah so italy before, like, uh, the creation of the Kingdom of Italy in, like, the late 1800s was a bunch of small little kingdoms, which the Pope liked just fine, because that meant the Pope also had more lands outside of just the Vatican. But then uh, the royal line of Savoy from this tiny island called Sardinia. I don't think you guys even know what this place is. I know where uh, it is. There are a lot is. of sardines. It's yeah, actually it's, came it's, up, it's actually came up quite a bit if, like, you played uh, Crusader Kings or something like that. I mean, it, historically Latin speaking, Latin. it was pretty powerful back in the day. And then Napoleon yeah. came along and he's like, lol, sardines, and then just kicked them out of power. <laughs> but um, basically, they started grouping together, pulling together more and more of these disparate city-states until they became what's known as the Kingdom of Italy. And part of that yeah. meant taking over land that used to belong to the church and to the Pope. So the Pope, in a massive turn of pride and perfect diplomatic tact, said, this is not good. So we're going to make it not exist by not recognizing it. So there is no kingdom of Italy. Things are wow, just as okay. they were before you guys existed as a kingdom. It's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like the whole like Taiwan, China situation, you know? Like, uh, you just don't recognize them. You yeah. Them as your own. Yeah. Or like how North Korea treats South Korea, you know? Well, North so, Korea treats the rest of the world like it doesn't exist. <laughs> That's true. Pretty much. And uh, so as a result, the king and the pope here, well, the pope doesn't even recognize the king as the king of Italy. And the king really couldn't care less about the pope. Just has to like give lip service to it and then keeps on running a powerful country. So <laughs> there wasn't much of a, a reprochment, if you will. But a at the same time... ignorance and... Well, not ignorance. What's the word? Just like... Like a care. salutary neglect? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just kind of like push it out of your mind worry about other things but like if you're an italian citizen this is always kind of like a, a weird tension it's like on the one hand i am loyal to the pope i'm loyal to the church on the other hand i'm supposed to be loyal to the king to the italian government how can it be both so it's like this weird little like uh uh what's the term here um dichotomy yeah it's like a weird little dichotomy that all these people are forced to kind of embrace it's a very um, strange one for sure yeah but on the flip side, if you want to talk about checks and balances, here you go. You have the king, who is in charge of the political stuff, and then you have the church, who is in charge of the the, uh, the ecclesiastical, the religious stuff, the spiritual stuff. And uh, if one like goes fascism. too far, the other one always technically has a moral check on the other one. It could always mobilize the people, you know, in some way or another. Technically. And here's the thing. If you're Mussolini, right, you're, you're looking at this and you're like, ah, yeah, you know what? A career in politics... Might by, might be the way to go. Um, probably won't do to have a lot of obstacles in your path, right? Yeah, make things easier, Farragon, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in that whole sense, you got to be able to deal with both the church and the king somehow. Now, obviously, you can't just go and beat the crap out of them like your uh, newsies on the streets can to <laughs> communists. Well, so sure. like... He's gonna he's gonna embrace something a bit more tactful. So uh, our good friend Benito Mussolini decides let's uh, let's let's start with the closer one. Let's start with the king of Italy first, and uh, we gotta be diplomatic. We gotta be tactful. 
we got to send my army of black shirts marching into Rome, demanding that he put me into power. Tactful, yes. Yeah. Subtle. Very it's very subtle. subtle. Very like, exactly. subtle. Yeah, you got to squint at it to just like make out his personal agenda there. It's kind of hard to see. Yeah, you just need to squint at the giant... Probably because everyone black wears shirt. black shirts. So, <laughs> again, they blend it in. the black That's shirt squint. thing Can't it's really not, it's not a uniform. It's just a black fucking shirt. So it's like, your majesty, there's an army of black shirts outside. What do you mean? Well, there's a they bunch of people wearing black right. shirts out there. It's like, isn't that every Saturday? It's like, well... I mean, yes, but they look angrier than usual. <laughs> just, and if just you squint, you can see they're all holing newspapers, too. <laughs> so, <laughs> Billy just a bunch of the newspapers. Pretty hey. much. <laughs> and uh, so on, in 1922, Mussolini organizes this huge coup d'etat called the March on Rome. Pretty much send his black shirts in, assert some pressure on the government, demand change. Like, he, he wasn't even very explicit as to what he wanted out of it. He just, like... I mean, obviously, he wanted to get himself and the fascists into more positions of power. But exactly what he saw out of this was never, like, really clear. And um, the success rate of this wasn't really clear either. Because keep in mind, at the end of the day, yes, you got a bunch of pissed off, angry guys wearing black shirts and waving newspapers. But the king's got the Italian army on his side. And the last time some pissed off Italian with an angry mob decided to declare war on the government of Italy, he got his ass stomped in the little city of Fiume. So, oh, basically, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so Mussolini, I mean, he might have been a bit crazy and deluded with his, like, whole visions of grandeur, but he wasn't a complete idiot. So our brave friend Mussolini decides to uh, lead the operations from afar. Ah, yes. Uh, Just yes. like, yeah. many, like every many other time of you he tried to die, join an army. But it is a sacrifice I am willing to make. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. And, uh, uh delegation. So, take... So, just like taking a, a note from his past history, he decides if everything goes south, I'm a bounce to Switzerland, you know? Hey. Just like before. <laughs> Part Old two. habits so, die hard. I know, right? And he, yeah, I don't know, like maybe turn a new leaf, become a socialist again, whatever floats his boat. But um, at I this hear the point. the chocolate's good. Yeah, the chocolate's pretty good. He the might start are always smuggling nice watches out of Switzerland. <laughs> yeah. And also, they got some, uh, they got some good health care there, too. So he's able to just put himself right on the border of Italy and Switzerland. So he could like, te- like, like if everything goes great, he could be like, yes, you know, I was here for it all. I was in Italy for this entire thing. Uh, <laughs> was I in Rome? No. Was I anywhere near Rome? No. But I was in Italy. So that counts. Um, and if everything goes south, he could literally just hop across the border and he could hide out in some small villa in, uh, in Switzerland. If Actually, everything goes south, he can follow suit. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> well, if, if everything goes south, he'll go north, if you will, um, right into Switzerland and just take out the rest of his time just enjoying some hot chocolate and some good skiing up there. And, right. uh, yeah, I, I mean, like, c- could you imagine if, like, that was the way that Mussolini's story ended? He literally that just retired the into Switzerland. End of fascism uh, in wrote, that chapter. Yeah, it, it became, like, uh, just, like, an angry, like, Radical just writing newspapers, but that's about it. You know? No, oh, radical things could have newsie changed. that somehow got himself a newspaper mafia. The first Italian <laughs> mafia. Yeah, the first Italian newspaper mafia. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, I, I think there were more than a couple mafia before All right, fair Mussolini's time. <laughs> yeah, but none of them were focused on newspapers as much as he was, that's for sure. But all things considered, Things went a bit better than our bumbling idiot friend Mussolini could have planned. So, when the uh, when the huge forces of black shirts, because like there were a few hundred of them, so like kudos for him to like rally up that many people to go and uh, march on Rome. Um, how many of them knew that Mussolini wasn't even there? I don't know, but like he definitely inspired them enough to like pick up their newspapers and start marching, and uh, they pour into Rome. A bunch of these disgruntled old veterans, college students, and unemployed workers, uh, and so on. And King Victor Emmanuel, the king of Italy, is just standing there, like, on his balcony. And he's, like, looking at these hordes of people pouring in. And he's, like, got advisors on both sides, right? Like, he's got the the voice of reason there, being like, Hey, your majesty, you know, um, you do have this little something called an army. You could always (laughs) use that to disperse the crowds. 
it's still a little martial law. I mean, like, I know it's not great and all, but these guys are literally creating riots in the streets. Like, their their entire purpose for existing is violence. Like, it's literally in their doctrine. They're like, hey, also news. Doctrine. Also news. And news about violence. But it's like, there, there's like nothing redeemable about these people. And then on the other hand, there's like a few like rich bigwigs. It's like, ah. I mean, I wouldn't say nothing redeemable about him. Like, he does beat up communists pretty well. And uh, he, like, keeps our striking workers in line. So, he makes us money. And, uh, oh, and, and he creates law and order. Yeah, because everywhere he goes, people are too afraid to speak up against him to, like, create any sort of ruckus. So, he's the only and guy committing ruckus. And he's a job creator. And he creates jobs. He employs newsies. And he, uh... <laughs> You know, like, <laughs> I, I'm sure he has other good things about him, He's too. He's just like, so well-rounded. Can't you tell? Yeah, well, at that point, his well-rounded nature might have been due more to his uh, substantial diet than anything else. But <laughs> yes, very well-rounded as well. And of course, he's a vet from the First World War. Oh, yes, mm-hmm. that's right. Two he's time. a veteran. <laughs> it never looks good to turn out veterans with your army, you know? Meanwhile, Hoover in uh, the United States is like, you guys want a bonus for serving in World War I? <laughs> that's funny send in the army and then uh yeah that didn't go over so hot either rest in peace bonus army Your but brownies. yeah but back in italy our king here is like wrestling with these decisions here and then finally someone's like look mussolini is a weak dude like literally before all we had to do was pay him some money and then he changed and did a full 180 you know on his positions on things I'm sure we could do the same if we, like, give him some sort of a government position. And, uh, you know, he decides to take all the black shirts, call them off, and then dedicate them to serving the government. You know? You this take totally the outsider, you put them into the government, and then Bonus they'll be loyal to the army. system. Yeah. <laughs> it never goes wrong. It never happens, right? He's a malleable figure. He's weak. We could just use him to keep order and suppress the labor problems. Yep, I'm sure so, that Stalin will never do anything wrong. No, not at all. And all of a sudden, the king just has this epiphany. He's like, oh my gosh, you're right. That's genius. I, I can control him uh, by making him the prime minister of Italy. <laughs> oh my god. I, 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 some, something tells me that's not what they initially had in mind. I mean, I, I'm sure that even some of those more, uh, like, the more, like, pro-Mussolini factions were like, I, I mean... <laughs> I was saying, like, make him a secretary or, like, give him an internship in the government. I, I Like, I, I wasn't saying prime minister per se. It's a bit of a leap for someone Isn't who, like, literally had nothing but newspaper writing. Yeah, that's real that. fucking sudden. Isn't there a prime minister already? There was, and he was like, wait, what the, <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck is going on here? So they just kicked him out? <laughs> Pretty much. So, All right. So Victor Emmanuel decides, I'm just going to... Make him prime minister of Italy and uh, give him some emergency powers. And that should shut him up for now. You know, like he'll he'll come to his senses. He'll he'll listen to us, the government, and he'll be able to bring peace. And oh, order no. And emergency jobs. powers. Oh, yeah. Why would you do that? You already this gave is, him the prime minister job. Just leave it at that. Maybe give him exactly less power. Not more. power. So Mussolini. Once again, you got to keep in mind, Mussolini is like just like nervously like tapping his fingers in this like little cottage all the way in northern Italy, ready to just duck out on like the closest train to Switzerland at a moment's notice when he hears like everyone got slaughtered in Rome or something like that. And all of a sudden this guy comes in just. Uh, Mr. Mussolini. Yeah. Uh, message from Rome for you, sir. And he's like, oh, fuck, I can't open the door. There's probably, like, a bunch of, like, cops outside ready to take me in. I've he's already been arrested once, man. I can't do it again. I've already like, been in prison. And like, uh, He shut the window. Sees one it, guy only. <laughs> it just sees one guy wearing a black shirt. <laughs> and his like, mistress is like, I, I, is that a black shirt? It's like, I don't know. Everyone wears black shirts. I can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> okay. can tell. Even the police the uniforms are starting to turn black. I don't know what they're doing. Uh, but he, like, finally... Pulls it together enough to like open the door and the actually there. that may you make a good point. If the cops are wearing the did, same stuff, did did police wear black back then? N- not necessarily. They... No. Okay. No. The, the, it's not all black. It, it, there's a there's a thin blue line on it. 
there's a there's like a small little like ribbon to show what side you're on or something. But basically, it has like a opens the touch, door, and that's how you tell. A little bit, a tiny touch. A tiny, uh, tiny bit. Yeah. Or just like a, a small pla- a patch of red. It could be like a pasta sauce stain or something. <laughs> but like, you, you can't tell. Um, but basically, he opens the door. And the messenger's like, Hey, uh, a letter from the king. You're now the prime minister. Good luck. <laughs> and he's like, wait, wait a second. I didn't plan for this. I wasn't expecting this. How, how many people did we lose? I to Switzerland already planned out. What do you mean I'm the prime minister? Yeah, I already put down the down payment on this lovely little resort in the middle of the Alps. Like, I can't just return that. But I am prime minister, so I guess I can make the government pay for that instead. Okay, yeah, put it, so in, put it on their tab. Lost. Or maybe, genius move. I'm going to make the first order as prime minister be to give me, the prime minister, a vacation in Switzerland. Hey. Amazing. Genius. But eventually he comes. That? I don't know if you can actually do that. I'm pretty sure you can't actually do that. Well, see, he opens the letter, right? And he reads, You've been given emergency powers. And he's like, Oh, well, I guess there's a lot I can do now, can I? I guess so, emergency powers does include free vacation. I'm sure it could. I'm sure you could do whatever the hell you want with emergency powers at that they point. They are emergency after all. That's if it's true. An emergency, then yeah, you should take a vacation, I guess. Pretty much. The emergency is that he hasn't had a vacation for so long. You know? <laughs> but he comes back. It's 1922. And his first thing to do is, I will restore law and order. And you know how he does it? Uh, he, he approves the TV show for another running? <laughs> no. <laughs> if only. If only. No, he, he's still coming up with the concepts of law and order at that point. Uh, but no, he basically tells all his black shirts who have been riding in the streets to just, okay, mission accomplished, you guys can pack it up. And they do that, and it's like, aha! See, I've created law and order from the chaos that you otherwise <laughs> oh would have been God. completely Look at my lost in. Chaos. That was completely that right. your fault. I mean, yes, but he did create law and order. Yeah, he, right. did he, live he literally just it. fucking, oh my God. And the king's yeah. like sitting in the corner, and he's like, holy shit, this guy's amazing. And the king the is like, oh, like, look at that, you know, yes. our malleable prime ministers doing exactly as we told them, you know, to clean up his act and bring the fascists out of here. This is and exactly Mussolini is like, as we planned. Yeah, pretty much. But then Mussolini is like, <laughs> well, hold on, maybe not all of the black shirts should leave. Oh, and no. uh, he goes around, cherry picks uh, a few of his most like loyal newsies, and uh, he puts them into like all the key government positions. So hey. he he basically packs his ministry with fascists who you got to keep in mind, even though they were like growing into a big gang, we're still a very small minority in the grand scheme of things in Italy at this time point. Uh, and also uh, the emergency powers that he was given, it was supposed to last only one year. But because he had his government literally be packed full of fascists, they then vote to extend the emergency powers indefinitely yes because and, the uh, emergency is still oh my in god effect. this isn't even like this is even that clever this is just it's stupid. not it's really yeah. not corruption at its finest but but here's the thing right like like it's it's okay to justify an emergency if like your economy is shit and the people are striking and you know there's violence in the streets like, like that's easy to justify right but like if you're improving things you would imagine things would get to the point where people are like, you did a great job with those emergency powers, pal, but like, could you hand them over? Because you, you seem to have like solved the emergency here, you know? But what do you do when that stuff is gone and you want to keep that power, you know? You make you it You create more emergencies with your big army. You could you, do that, yeah. You start a coup you could, you could. for the local religious group. And then you could do you, that, yeah. <laughs> and then you uh, convert the uh, your lands into a grand galactic empire. Yeah, yeah, and then you could become old Daddy Palpatine as well. Yeah. Um, oh. But Mussolini Stay. is like looking at all this power in his hand, and he's like, "Well, I mean, th- this should last a while, surely. I mean, like, we gotta crush all the fucking Marxists and communists in Italy, and we know there's a lot of them. Meanwhile, the four Marxists in Italy who are now thrown in prison playing Magic the Gathering together. Like, oh. You're like, what the fuck do you mean? There's more of us. <laughs> Where? Yeah. What did we know? 
And also he's like, oh, the economy is terrible. It can't recover anytime soon. And all of a sudden America's like, uh, let's, uh, let's throw some money into the European economy. Let's bolster that up with a bunch of loans. And then all of a sudden, would you know it, the economy in the Mediterranean and in Europe in general just, boom, just grows out of nowhere because of this huge stimulus from the Americans. So now the economy problem's solved too. Uh, and also he's like, you know what? There's a ton of striking workers. So like, we, we got to be able to handle this, right? But all the workers then are now under the control of the government, under like this big government union, if you will. So now he's like, well, fuck. All the problems I had before are gone. The change what do I is do? here. A change is here. I did this way too well. And by like 1926, uh, say what you will for him being like kind of an incompetent asshole. Uh, through the use of strict censorship, uh, tight government control over taxes, crushing worker strikes, and also harsh punishment, and uh, also extra legal punishment through those black shirts, he's basically turned Italy around. <laughs> like through a series of accidents basically yeah and at this point he's like looking at himself like oh dip what do i do now <laughs> the ultimate idiot savant pretty much and uh so at this point he's like literally my newspaper is the only newspaper that we could have out there and uh, my party is like the only one that's really out there in the government so he's like um I'll just run for re-election, I guess. I, like, I don't even need to do coups anymore. I could just run on democratic principles. Uh, democratic DM. principles, in air quotes. Baker. And, uh, Trademark. And as long then, as I am the only candidate. Yeah, my, I'm the only candidate. I've intimidated everyone else from coming out through my black shirts and through now the use of the police. Uh, and uh, yeah, you know what? Fine, you could take away the emergency powers because I'm still in charge. And that's the scary part. He literally doesn't even need the emergency powers at this point. He didn't even do anything, though. Like, he... <laughs> the most he's done is oh, he cracked God. down harshly, and somehow the economy turned around in the meantime. You know? It's like, he came in just as the economy was about to recover. So you know all those, those YouTube videos before? about Luigi playing Mario Party and doing nothing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, this is, uh, that's Mussolini right here. And he somehow won the game, too. So at this point, this is like 1926. This is pre-Great Depression. So that's why the economy is still like growing. I think Roaring Twenties at this time. And he's like, wow. I mean, I thought the king was going to be a bigger challenge than this, but he literally gave me power without any bloodshed and just like told me to roll with it. And at this point, even the king is like, he's got like the, like the, the Mussolini t-shirt on, which is just a black mm. shirt. Um, look, look, I made this guy work. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, it's you like that's my boy, that's my Mussolini, <laughs> and he's like actually pro-fascist at this point. So like he's even got the king in his corner, whereas before like, the king was like, I like can maybe use. Yeah, that's my kid. I yeah, him pretty. That. I got yeah. him there. I, <laughs> I got that. him there. <laughs> I raised this boy. <laughs> I raised my boy Mussolini, um, and uh, at this point too, it's like. Well, I mean, that's one of the main challenges down. What are we going to do about the other one? Because, like, clearly, the Pope isn't going to stand for this, right? Like, whereas before, the Italian government's always been kind of wishy-washy. Now that things are unified underneath one powerful authority, behind someone who, remember, back in his socialist days, he was like, I don't believe in God, and you shouldn't either. God is basically just made up to oppress the people, and the church and all that stuff is a bunch of hooey. So, like... We have a devout atheist who is now in charge of Italy. Like, put yourself in the papal robes for a moment there, you know? But Italy doesn't exist according to the Pope, doesn't it? I mean, Italy doesn't officially exist. But at the same time, the Pope isn't completely deluded to the point where he's like, you know, like, I could just walk over all of my old fiefdoms and nothing's going to happen to me. Yeah, it's so, only a matter of time before the church gets storms with, stormed with people in black shirts holding newspapers. Right. I mean, like, it happened <laughs> to the king. It the could Vatican happen to me, too. Black shirts. Yeah, and pretty much. I they know. Can tell we'll make him the pope, too. We'll make him the pope. No, <laughs> thankfully, it was not that insane. And he was not anointed to become a cardinal or something crazy like that. But whereas, like, the whole Mussolini and how he got into power in the government thing could easily be seen as, like, a bunch of happy accidents kind of playing out. How Mussolini dealt with the Pope. This was actually kind of impressive, all things considered. 
Um, because at the end of the day, Mussolini's in a good bargaining position, right? Like, it controls most of Italy. It controls the areas surrounding the Vatican. Uh, and at the end of the day, he controls one of the most devout populations to the Pope, who the Pope th- therefore depends on for support. So, yes, the Pope can turn the people against Mussolini. Does but the that Pope was have like a military of some sort. He's got like the Swiss guards in the right. Vatican. So like there's something. But the last time that the Swiss guards ever had to like fight any major battles, it involved basically all of them dying in order to shuttle the Pope into a hide a, a little castle as everyone sacked Rome. So huh. like this ain't exactly like an expansion uh, an expansionary army, one that could like go out of its borders to like put up a fight, you know? So the Pope and Mussolini are kind of like at this. Yeah, they don't even have any cool still. black shirts. No, no. Instead, they got like they still have like the the uniforms designed by what was it, Michelangelo, at that time. <laughs> the really colorful ones. Yeah, it's like the purple and yellow plumes with like the weird like conquistador metal helmets and the halberds. Right. The uh, very floofy sleeves and stuff. Yeah, the very puffy, floofy sleeves, um, and uh, that that's the Pope's army. Meanwhile, Mussolini's actually got the Italian army, which just fought in World War I and actually came out on top to a degree. Um, and, and so the Pope and Mussolini are like at this weird little standstill, especially since Mussolini at this point has gotten all the power and he's like, I'm going to be able to run things as I see fit. I'm going to go talk to the Pope. So he goes over to the Pope and he's like, hey, Holy Father, uh, what do you say? We end this old feud. Like, I get it. You don't think I exist. And you don't want me to, like, run a fake kingdom that hasn't existed for, like, the past 50 years in your mind. Um, But, like, you're not getting anything out of it. We're not getting anything out of it. We could all just, like, play this down and be able to make things all better, right? So in 1929, he starts negotiating with the Pope and the Vatican, and they they come up with this huge agreement that they call the Lateran Accords. And uh, the first thing that it did was that Italy is like, we're going to allow the Pope to run everything in the Vatican as a separate country. So the Vatican City is going to be independent of Italy. We renounce any claims. I just have this thing pictured in my head of Mussolini going up to the Pope like, hey, I'm Mussolini, I'm the new prime minister of Italy, and the Pope is just like, prime minister of what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Italy, you know, the country that surrounds all your land and has most of your most, of oh, your you most faithful people? Country? I'm sorry, what like, country? No, no, what are you not ringing about? any bells here. And believe me, I have plenty of bells to ring as the Pope. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, like that big church bell right, right up there. Yeah. It's like, ah, oh, come on. You gotta recognize the fact that, like, everyone around here has Italian passports and all that. It's like, I, we don't use passports here, man. We're still, like, no dated to, like... We're all yeah, pretty humans. Pretty much. No one leaves. Earth. We all love it here. You're here forever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Don't forget. Yeah. And uh, so, at this point, Italy's like, fine, we're not gonna bother with trying to take over the Vatican City. Uh, we're not gonna take over the Pope's last remaining pieces of land. And uh, we're going to, you know what, instead, we're going to exchange some ambassadors with you guys. And, uh, like, for everyone who's, like, just, like, listening on a surface level, an exchange of ambassadors is like, oh, boy, you send someone over to talk to you, and you send someone to talk to me. Big whoop, you know? But the, the thing underneath that is if you're sending ambassadors, like, government officials to do this kind of negotiations, you're tacitly acknowledging the existence of the other state. And so by doing this, like this simple exchange of ambassadors between the, Ro- like the, uh, between the government in Rome for Italy and with the Vatican Church, they basically just went ahead and did what no one has been able to do in the duration of the Kingdom of Italy. Get it recognized by the fucking Pope. Which is like kind of a big deal, given the fact that like not being recognized also means not having the, pa- the Pope's blessings. And if you're a Catholic in a Catholic government running a Catholic regime over Catholic people, that's kind of a big deal, you know, not having so the Pope be behind So why wasn't the previous king able to do that? Well, just because walking. The, it was a mix. The, there were some who were just like, they didn't really give too, ma- too many shits about it because they were more focused on other issues. Uh, 
And then others who are openly antagonistic against the Pope, who are like, the Vatican kind of belongs to Italy because it's in Italy. So <laughs> hand over those like keys to St. Peter's Gate, you know? Um, but basically, at this point, Mussolini was able to get all of Italy recognized by the church. It now exists. Hooray. He's now actually the prime minister of an actual country. Whoop dee. Um, wow. But the second part, the second part, and this is like, this is kind of a big step. If you're like a pronounced atheist back in the day, he goes ahead and he makes Catholicism the official state religion of Italy. So As now, an atheist. As opposed to before? I mean, before it was like the unofficial the, religion yeah. of Italy. But like now he makes it the state religion and to like swing the deal a bit, he also goes ahead and ensures that everyone who goes to a public school gets taught Catholicism. So like imagine you go into class, it's like, welcome class to your first day of school. Uh, today we're going to be going over our agenda. We'll start with a bit of maths. Then we go over basics of fascism. What the fuck is it? And uh, finally, we'll uh, go over some good old uh, church studies. So, you know, take out your books, take your notes, and be a good Catholic Italian. And the answer is so, we don't know either. Both fascism and what the church is. Yes. But we have to listen to both of them. Full devotion to both of them. But, like, that's kind of a big deal. Especially if you're the church. And at this point, you're like, uh, you know, in the past years, we've actually started seeing memberships start to decline. People aren't really believing in us anymore. And all of a sudden, this guy just goes ahead and enforces catholicism upon everyone i mean you know this fascism thing might not just be too bad after all you know especially since the communists are the ones who are like all about like religion is a like is a fraud it's meant to oppress the people and this guy beats up catholics or no not beats up catholics beats up <laughs> communists <laughs> yes he's going around whopping the pope um <laughs> He but, said uh, this is new you know, we don't the know chambers. what the negotiations actually look like. For all we know, he just went to the Pope with a newspaper in hand. Just and thwack. Just slap thwack. Like a, like a dog. Just Pope. whack on the head. Thwack, thwack. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and all of a sudden, he's able to get the church officially taught, like Catholicism, taught throughout Italy. And Italy is now recognized by the Pope. Now, obviously... He also learned a bit from earlier negotiations, you know, with the British who like smuggled some money to make him change his tune. He, uh, he decided that everyone has their price as well. So to sweeten the deal, to like really make things like work out, he goes ahead and pays a lump sum of money to the church uh, officially uh, as a means of like paying for all the land that was lost when the kingdom of Italy kind of took over. Um, mm -hmm. But like, that's also a nice bribe, too, if you think about it, you know? Yeah. Like, there you go. A few million. Do with it what you will. You know, get yourself a good dinner. Um, you say learn from previous interactions with the British, but this really just sounds like, hey, they gave me money. I like money. I'll give him money. He'll like <laughs> that. Much. I mean, for someone who, you know, started off as a devout socialist and communist, or well, borderline communist, publishing newspapers against material goods, he sure as hell did exploit material goods a lot to try to get to his end, you know? Again. The things that money can change. Oh, absolutely. If you absolutely. give a socialist on money, you will. You'll get yourself a fascist. Yeah. <laughs> a socialist who's concerned about money and uh, unequal distribution of wealth, that there is a fascist. I guess that's the basic mm -hmm. equation there. Um, but yeah, so through this 1929 landmark agreement, he's now able to come back to Rome and be like, People of Italy, I have now made it so you exist. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I have very proven much, yes. your existence. <laughs> I have proven beyond a shadow of a doubt your existence in the eyes of God. So, like, what about if the you're... Vatican? Like, they're, they're their own thing now. Don't worry about that. Yeah, I mean, like, yes, we have, like, a country in the middle of our country. But, like, that's fine. It's fine. Um, just think about it as the meatball in our pasta, you know? It makes everything all better. <laughs> um... But, That's a terrible analogy. Are you got a better one? <laughs> uh, uh, we could also get a constructive proof that shows that Italy not only exists, but is a specific country. Oh, but that requires <laughs> logic. That requires too much unique. logic for a fascist to understand. Hmm, We're fair. too busy about struggle and war here. We, we can't be talking about mathematic proofs. So, 
Mussolini comes back and he's like kind of a hero in the people's eyes because at this point the economy's turned around which Mussolini says is because of him um so like sure we'll take it i guess you know the economy's better um there's law and order quote unquote because the fascists aren't the ones beating up people or at least if they are they're wearing police uniforms now instead of just black shirts so, so it's just it's black shirts with a little bit of yeah now it's police brutality but it's for a good cause you know it's for being anti-communist um and uh, for propping up all those rich factory owners who don't want strikes happening. Um, so police brutality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was much more accepted during that time. You know, man, how things have fallen apart. You know back in the day when you could get beaten up by the cops and no one would raise a fuss? Those were the good old days. You know? um, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Everything was so much more peaceful back then. But no, it, it was, uh, it, it's basically, you could say it was a regime of terror. I guess. But, like, if you're the average Italian who's, like, seeing nothing but, like, you know, your country basically nullified in the eyes of your own church and your economy falling to shit and your laws falling apart and the chance of getting beaten up for having the wrong newspaper when you're walking down the street. Like, now, well, first off, you won't have the wrong newspaper because there's only one newspaper that you could have, courtesy of Mussolini. <laughs> um, and, and also, like, things are less chaotic now and there's no communists anymore. Not like there were before, but like now you, there's definitely no more communists in Italy anymore. So this Mussolini guy, and, and also the king's like his number one fan too. So like this Mussolini guy. What a complete guy. accidental diplomat. Right? Like none of this was thought out. <laughs> so he might not be that bad after all. So like if you're, an, if you're an Italian during this time period, Mussolini, being like pro-Mussolini and pro-fascist, or at least like not speaking out against it, perfectly fine way of living your life because everything seems to be better and Mussolini who's like seen himself succeed despite like once again like n having no real background for this kind of stuff and just like literally coming in at the right place at the right time with the right bunch of thugs with the right newspaper is like now the prime minister of Italy the duce if you will of Italy the leader or uh, also the douche if you will of Italy <laughs> um, I mean still a bit of a jump Let's be honest. I mean, like, from like I an angry as we, say, as we say in the business, uh, you take those. Yeah, you just take <laughs> them. But there's always, there's always like that little thing in the back of his mind because like he's all about war. He's all about we need to expand Italy for like greatness and all that stuff. And uh, he hasn't done a lot of expanding. I mean, like yes, he could have gone ahead and taken like the Vatican City, and that would have been like a nice, easy addition to italy but he didn't do that he he decided to make peace uh and now he's like itching for a fight so his next big idea his next big brain idea is like i've made italy great why don't i make italy the next roman empire oh my god oh boy <laughs> so let's let's just expand overseas and take over ethiopia you know that's that a very specific great. choice. <laughs> it's 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 more natural than you think about it if you uh, consider where Ethiopia is. Yeah, Ethiopia. Uh, for those of you who aren't too familiar with uh, geography, Ethiopia is located in like the northeastern corner of Africa, kind of like right where like it points out towards Egypt and Saudi Arabia, right around that area. So it's great for shipping and all that stuff. It's also been the only place in Africa which during the whole scramble for Africa, when every single European country, even like tiny little Belgium, was cutting out a chunk of Africa to colonize, Ethiopia was the one place that was able to hold out against colonization. That's because right. it was a Christian kingdom uh, in Africa. And so like it had some like moral superiority that they could like flaunt over these Christian Europeans who are coming in. They can't just say that we're coming here to Christian, uh, like to to like uh, teach the word of God to you guys. Cause they're like, we know we have like the oldest church here. Like we know about God and we know about Jesus Christ. We're cool with Dude, him we too. Are God. No. <laughs> but like, uh, because they're also like a holdout. Um, and also because the things in uh, Libya, which like Italy has been attempting to do. And it's like been a weird, like flux back and forth. It's like doing okay enough. Mussolini is going to decide it's time to take fascism abroad. And he thinks the best way to start is by starting the second Italian-Ethiopian war. 
Second, because the first one did not go so hot for the Italians. What was uh, the first one? Uh, this was with the... the oh, I'd say it's, that was the one with the like, fire government. Uh, was that the one where the, the poet tried to you know do his thing and then got destroyed for it? Oh, that's Fiume. That's that's like in the the Balkans. It's a lot oh, closer okay. to Italy, not in Africa. But um, there was a first. All you need to know, there was a first one. It didn't go so well for the Italians, even though they had superior weaponry and they got their asses handed to them by the uh, Ethiopian kingdoms, which rallied together. Uh, the Ethiopian kingdom, which rallied together and pushed out the Italians. But um, we could save that for another episode, talking about how Mussolini decides to fan out fascism. And just how this stuff I just, spreads. I just feel like every single one of Mussolini's plans is missing a step. Like, step one, make a newspaper. Step two, question mark, question mark, question mark. Step, step three, step question, two, mark, question, question mark, question mark, question <laughs> mark. Step four, become prime minister. Yeah, there you go. Wait, wait, wait a minute. We're missing something here. Once again, if you, we forgot if you to like, boil the pasta. Yeah, they forgot to boil the pasta, to be sure. But hey, at the end of the day, you know, if it's edible, that's all that matters, right? And likewise, for Mussolini here, don't think too much about it. But there is something to be said. Again. <laughs> because again it worked again. again and again and again. Somehow. But there is something to be said, though, about what happens when you start pushing things a bit too far. And now, because he's actually the prime minister of a country, and he's like technically got a good amount of street cred underneath his name, and fascism has become a thing, his ideas also start going beyond just Italy as well. Um, into places like Spain, which is undergoing its own civil war, into the Balkans, where we see a bunch of petty dictators start taking over with fascist ideas, and uh, also into Germany as well, with a young man by the name of Adolf Hitler. Oh, no. 